I'm Nan Geschke, your host of the Los Altos History Show. Tonight we are very fortunate to have as our guest Edgar McDowell. Welcome, Edgar. So pleased to have you here this evening. Thank you for the invitation. Well, you're very welcome. Edgar lived in Los Altos during the 1920s and 1930s. And although he lives now in Palo Alto, he's still very interested in our town and many of our inhabitants. One of Edgar's chief interests during his lifetime has been Boy Scouting and we'll be talking with him tonight about his involvement in scouting. But first, Edgar, I think our viewers would really like to know more about you and your family, how uh, your family um, came to this area. I, I understand that your father uh, first came out uh, to attend Stanford, is that correct? Yes, he came here from Ashland, Ohio to attend Stanford in 1895 when the university was four years old. Wow. He was the first member of his family to attend a college. Stanford had no tuition at the time, but uh, you still had to have ro money for room and board. My father needed to earn a little money on the side, so he was looking for work right away and succeeded in getting a part-time clerical job in the registrar's office at Stanford. And at the same time, he secured an assignment with the Southern Pacific Railroad as their representative on the Stanford campus to That's keep them informed about the movement of students and uh, names of new students and where they were coming from and faculty the same, and also because this university that had been so highly publicized in the eastern papers as a university built out in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. why when visiting dignitaries came out from the east by train, the Southern Pacific liked to have somebody show them around Stanford. So my father. So that had, was your father. My huh? father had that assignment. Well, that was quite a nice assignment. Yeah. And yeah. he, he, he held that job for many years. He held the Southern Pacific assignment for 42 years. 42 and years. When he graduated from Stanford, it took him five years because he was working a little on the side, graduated in 1900. He was offered a job as assistant registrar at the university. And the Southern Pacific offered him a full-time job as in their passenger sales department. He elected to take the Stanford job, but he kept the Southern Pacific job on the side. So he was, uh, worked at Stanford for 37 years and for the Southern Pacific for 42 years. Oh, so he actually he retired at the end of 1937. Oh, wow. So he actually held two jobs then? Well, the main job was with the university. university. The Southern Pacific job was just a little side issue. A side issue. But uh, it brought a little income. Oh, sure. And that was... And a pass on the railroad. And that was important, wasn't it? It did, not only for him, but for his family. Uh-huh. So I rode the railroad for free. Well, uh, did you take many family trips then? Yes. On the Some. railroad? He took me east on a business trip for the university in 1914 when I was six years old. I can still remember it. Oh, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that he became acquainted with Paul Schelp, who, uh, who was 
is considered our town founder here in Los Altos. And uh, Paul <coughs> became um, the president of the Southern Pacific at, at, uh, at a later point in his career, but um, I believe that you and your, and, and your father, he and your father yes. uh, became uh, acquainted with one another, is that correct? Correct. Paul Schell became president of the Southern Pacific in 1929. And he went to work in, for the railroad in 1892, I believe in San Bernardino. Mm -hmm. And uh, he received his first official appointment in 1900 as district freight and passenger agent in San Jose. And that was the position to which my father reported in connection with his work for the Southern Pacific at Stanford. So he came under Paul Schaup's jurisdiction and they became very good friends and remained so as long as they were both alive. And, uh, and, and I, I, I believe uh, Paul was, uh, Paul Schaup actually encouraged your father to help him sell lots when he well, started to sell they, lots. Uh, when the Southern Pacific uh, built a track from uh, what's now South Palo Alto to Los Gatos, uh, going right through what's uh, now the middle of Los Alamos, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Schaup, uh, I think, had something to do with the railroad acquiring the land to get through here. And the uh, land in the, what would be the down, downtown Los Alamos was owned by two sisters. Uh, Sarah Winchester. The, and Winchester mm -hmm. had the only house really in, in Los Altos and they weren't keen about having the railroad come through the middle of it. You know, there's stories and, uh, about them. So I think uh, Paul Schaup worked a little bit behind the scenes to help bring that about and then he uh, organized the Los Altos Land Company which bought the property that the Winchesters owned mm -hmm. and uh, founded roughly by Edith Avenue, San Antonio to El Monte, and then the the, uh, the creek back to Edith Avenue. The, we call and that the downtown triangle yes. now. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, he subdivided, uh, the Los Altos Land Company subdivided that property and Paul Schaup passed my father to help sell lots, which he did. And uh, He was quite he, successful too, wasn't uh, he? Well, I don't know how many he sold, <laughs> but the uh, commission that he got came not in cash, but in lots. Hmm. So he wound up owning several lots in Los Altos, and uh, including two on Main Street between 1st and 2nd Street, about where Max T Room is now. And he, those lots stayed empty because the, that first block in Los Altos did not get completely built up in the 30 years uh, before my father died in 1938. And he'd paid taxes on those lots all those years. And they never were developed. <laughs> never isn't, were developed. Isn't that interesting? And uh, they, uh, didn't, uh, there was no buildings on Main Street beyond 2nd Street except for the McCrum House, which was uh, between 3rd and 4th. Otherwise, uh, uh, so just uh, was very little in the way of business houses in Los Altos. Right. Now what about your mother, Edgar? I know she did well, My mother uh, came to Stanford from Iowa, Davenport, Iowa, in 1902. She was the third in her family to, mm. to come to Stanford from Iowa. Uh, my grandfather was the uh, principal of a school in Davenport and he believed in education mm -hmm. and saw that uh, all his children got a college education. And uh, my mother met uh, my father at Stanford. Uh, strangely enough, I think the earthquake was what finally got them married. <laughs> uh, and, uh, the earthquake was in April of 1906 Next. and the damage at Stanford was so great that the university closed uh, and uh, Dr. Jordan, the president of the university, sent the students home, told the seniors they'd get their diploma by mail. And uh, so my mother went back to Iowa. After about two months, my father couldn't stand it any longer. He got on the train, went back to Iowa, and talked my mother into marrying him right away. And so they were married in Davenport. And they lived and, uh, uh, on the campus at Stanford? Had a little 
honeymoon, came back to mm -hmm. Stanford, and uh, the, the soon after uh, built a house on San Juan Hill, the first house completed on that hill for faculty, and uh, moved into it when I was four months old. And one of the odd things about that is that uh, move forward a few years, uh, the um, Herbert Hoover had become chairman of the Commission for the Relief of the Belgian People in, uh, mm -hmm. in Europe there after World War I broke out. The Hoovers had been living in London where he was uh, involved in mining engineering, had become probably the top mining engineer in the world. And he t undertook this uh, food assignment for the Belgian people and never again worked uh, uh, for pay that he kept. And uh, he had another 50 years to his life from, from then. But uh, now they uh, anyhow, won. Uh, after a short time, why, uh, he decided Mrs. Hoover and the boys had better come back to the United States. He wasn't spending much time in London anyhow, and there was war risk there mm -hmm. in London. They came back and settled in a house across the street from us at Stanford. So I became very well acquainted with Mrs. Hoover and the two boys. Alan, the younger, was my age, and we did everything together mm -hmm. for a few years there. When World War I was over, the Hoovers then undertook to build their own house in the lot next to us at Stanford. So we had adjoining lots. Uh -huh. and. Uh, they built the house that is now the home of the president of the Stanford University. Going back, my father had become acquainted with Mrs. Hoover when she was still Lou Henry, because uh -huh. they were students at Stanford at the same time. Herbert Hoover had already graduated by just a few months before my father arrived, so that uh, he didn't get acquainted with Mr. Hoover until later, but he and Mrs. Hoover remained good friends, uh, uh, even uh, after they came, uh, after she came back from London to live on the campus. And I understand that they uh, they wanted your home, and that's one of the reasons oh, why you moved. We moved to Los Altos uh, because of the Hoovers. Uh, Mrs. Hoover's parents lived in Monterey. Were then by then quite elderly. Her mother, Mrs. Henry, was not well. She wanted to have her parents living close to mm -hmm. her. And she asked my father if he would consider selling our house, because we were the nearest house. And uh, so uh, this was done rather quickly. We didn't even have a house to move to, but my father said we got a, he had all these lots in Los <laughs> Altos, so why not build on them? Sure. And so mm -hmm. he hired Burge Clark to build a house for us. Burge was just getting started as an architect in Palo Alto. I think we were the, 37th house that he designed out of many hundreds over the years to come. And uh, while the house was being built, my mother and my two younger brothers, who were at grammar school, went to Pacific Grove to live. My mother liked the Monterey Peninsula. She came from Iowa, about as far from an ocean as you could get. And when she saw the Monterey Peninsula and Pacific Ocean, well, she fell in love with it. But they didn't want me to move because I was already attending Palo Alto High School. And then you went and on. You so went I came and lived with my grandparents. My grandfather uh, retired after 40 years of being principal of the same school in Davenport, Iowa. And since the th three of his children who had come to Stanford had stayed there, why? Well, he and his wife, my grandmother, and their youngest child came to California to live. And they bought the house in uh, uh, Los Altos Avenue, moved in there in 1913. It was one of three houses on Los Altos Avenue at that time. Is that right? Now, it's, it's still there. <laughs> before we get on to uh, you and your scouting, I wanted to just um, uh, ask you, I know your mother was active in the, uh, 
in the, the mothers group at Stanford and also the garden club in Los Altos, is that correct? Oh yes, um, to, uh, when we, after we came to Los Altos, my mother first was busy raising, raising her children. As Soon as she felt she had them far enough along, mm. she could start getting into activities. She uh, became active in the PTA here in Los Altos and she became president of the garden club, which held a, a show once a year down in what I think it's now Shout Park. Right. Uh, and, uh, and then she became the third president of the Stanford Mothers Club, uh, which was organized in the 30s. And incidentally, the first president of that club was Mrs. Paul Schaup. And uh, then my mother also became president of the uh, AAUW, that's American Association of University Women chapter in Palo Alto, shortly after it was established mm -hmm. in the 1930s. So she w became quite active. Very active. Yeah. Now we want to talk about you now, and that's, mm. uh, I know that uh, you became interested in scouting, or at least your father became interested in scouting for you. So how did you get attracted to scouting in the first place, well, Edgar? Uh, my father sent me to my first scout <laughs> meeting. I don't think I knew that the Boy Scouts existed. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, the scoutmaster was a Stanford law student named Edward Harper. He was a, um, had been during, during World War II, or, no, I mean, World War I, One. Had, had been a commissioned officer in the uh, Army in Europe. And uh, I don't know this for a fact, but I suspect that my father had recommended him for, to be the scoutmaster mm -hmm. of this troop. In any event, why, uh, he had me join, and uh, I guess I was hooked because I was stayed active in Boy Scout work for th the next 31 years. 31 years, uh, and I, I understand you were scoutmaster at one point. I was scoutmaster altogether for seven years, uh, spread out a little bit. I was scoutmaster on three different occasions. But uh, the first time, I, I wasn't old enough yet to be uh -huh. a scoutmaster, but uh, let me back up there. After Mr. Harper, uh, Victor Morgan, the um, uh, minister of the Episcopal Church in Los Alamos, was scoutmaster for a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he moved away, he recommended me as scoutmaster. By then I was a student at Stanford, but, but not uh, yet 21, uh, in which you had to be to be officially the scoutmaster. So mm -hmm. my father, was registered as scoutmaster, but he never came to a meeting. And uh, I served for a year, then I uh, stayed out a year, then I was scoutmaster for two more years, then I was, uh, the Southern Pacific moved me out of uh, town for a while. I uh, don't know whether I mentioned yet that I worked 42 years for the Southern yes. Pacific. So you followed your <laughs> and, father's, uh, in your father's and, footsteps and full time. then. Uh -huh. and, uh, but uh, then I, when I came back to Los Alamos, then I picked up and was scoutmaster again for another four years. So altogether, I served seven years as scoutmaster. Now, where did the scouts meet? I, I, when, I, when I joined in 1920, we were meeting in the second floor of the building at uh, Second and Main, Main. Street. The bank I think is there the now. Northwest corner, and you know which building that would yeah. be. And it has, it's, uh, a do, it's a two-story building. It was a, the only meeting place there was in town, mm -hmm. really. Everything, their school had been there even to begin with, and uh, I, I guess maybe some church meetings. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, problem of having it for Boy Scout meeting was that there was a grocery store underneath. And uh, if we ran around too much, you got in it, trouble. it knocked floor, <laughs> the, not the, um, the ceiling down and the plaster down into the groceries. So we, uh, the Captain Harper, we called him, but uh, he took us out and marched us up and down the main street of Los Alamos to uh, Get give us a little of that exercise. Out, and huh? the, mm -hmm. there, there weren't enough automobiles in those days, but once you could do that. And then um, there was a, a, a hall that was built. Oh, the, the, then a scout hall was built. Uh, they completed in 1922. I should back up just a little mm -hmm. bit here on the Boy Scouts. They were founded, I believe, in 1907 in England by uh, 
Lord Baden Powell, and uh, there was a businessman from the United States. He was in London on a foggy day in 1908 and having trouble where he wanted to get to, uh -huh. and a boy came up and asked if he could be of and the offer was accepted, and he guided this man to uh, where he wanted to go. The man then tried to tip him, and the boy told him he was a, a boy scout. They didn't take tips for doing a good turn. Mm -hmm. The man was intrigued, and he asked more about it, and then found out more about it. The, before he returned to the United States, when he did, he got some of his business friends in New York together, and they organized the Boy Scouts of America. Isn't that a wonderful and, story? Uh, so, the troop in Los Altos then was started in 1917, only nine years after the Scouts uh, had come to the United States. Herman Peters, a real estate uh, dealer in, in Los Altos, was the first Scoutmaster. And you were what, the third, and, uh, third so Scoutmaster? I probably was the third. third. Mm -hmm. Third. Now, what were some of the um, what were some of the outings that you used to do? Well, with the, uh, the, did you, I know the, you said you, you, you what used Mr. to. Mr. Harper believed in getting us outdoors, yes. and uh, we. Uh, um, I remember we took a hike to Felt Lake back of Stanford University one mm -hmm. Saturday. We other places we took hikes on Saturday, and then he liked to take us out to uh, El Monte Road to and Moody Road to the, what's now the uh, uh, Dubinick uh, place, hidden, hidden was then yes. called Hidden Villa. Yes. And uh, there we went uh, a little bit south, I suppose it would have been, uh, up a creek to a place called Ewing's Cabin. And we would camp there from Friday evening until sometime Sunday. And uh, there weren't many automobiles then. We, uh, we walked. We carried our mm -hmm. pack, our bedding. We, we didn't have sleeping bags then either. I don't know whether they'd been invented or not, but we sure didn't was, have them. The ground was hard. <laughs> and we, we took blankets and a ground cover and, uh, and some food and uh, spent the weekend out there. I don't know how many times we did now, that. Do you remember any of those, uh, those boys that may still be living here in Los Altos? Are there any, any of those scouts still around? Well, thinking for the time when I was scout master, the, um, well, going back to the beginning, the only boy I know of that's still alive of that very early group was Carl Schaup, is still living, his Paul Schaup's older son, still living in New Hampshire. I believe he's 97 years old. Oh, my. And I have been in correspondence with him. Uh -huh. that, uh, the, of the boys that were um, in the troop when I first was scoutmaster, Alan Cranston is one that's still living here and probably the most distinguished <laughs> of all the scouts that I had. It was, uh, he joined in 1926, and uh, it was quite a thrill when I could uh, sit in the Senate gallery back in Washington and, and watch one and of your scouts. And look down on the floor and see one of my scouts there uh, representing California in the Senate, which he did for 24 years. Yeah, that uh, must have been very exciting. Other boys that, uh, still live in Los Altos that I know of from my time as Scoutmaster would be Jim Ramsey, whose father had a garage on First Street, um, Bob Keller, whose father had a service yes. station on First actually, Street. Actually, Bob was one of our guests here. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Kent Wilder, George Cummings, one of the old timers. Yes, he probably goes neighbors. back to my first stint as, uh, as Scoutmaster and is still living here in Los Altos. There's three other boys I'd like to mention. Uh, to mention first, the highest rank in scouting is uh, Eagle Scout. Yes. At, the, in, at least in those days, one, about one scout in a hundred ever reached that rank. I think the percentage is now nearer 2%. Uh -huh. But uh, Captain Harper, Victor Morgan, never so much as mentioned the word Eagle Scout to us. I, I never had heard of them. At that time, uh, the whole emphasis was on now simply getting to the rank of first class scout. But uh, somewhere along the line, while I was scoutmaster, why well, we discovered that there was such a thing as an Eagle Scout. And finally, 
1937, 20 years after the troops started, while I was still scoutmaster, we had our first Eagle Scout. His name was Gilbert Gamblin, and he was followed very closely by two more, Warren Jensen and Pat Taylor. And the three of them had the badges awarded to them at the same, same time, one night in 1937, down in San Jose. That is so, that's a wonderful story. I, 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 I can't believe it, Edgar, but we're almost out of time, and there's still a lot of questions <laughs> I haven't been able to ask you about your life and, and your, your work on the, on the Southern Pacific, but maybe we'll do that another time. But uh, we've really enjoyed you talking a little bit about your family, about your father and your mother who came here to attend Stanford, and the relationship you've had with the Hoovers, and then your wonderful career as a scoutmaster in, in, uh, in Los Altos, and that troop, I guess, is the, the, was the first in Santa Clara County. So uh, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight, and uh, thank our viewers, too, for, uh, for uh, watching the Los Altos History Show. We'll see you the next time. Thanks. All right. Yeah.